Thank you, Andrew. All right, we're going to explore the relationship between complicated and complex systems. I'm going to lay the framework for some systems. We're going to start with nature. Nature is this incredibly magnificent, elegant, graceful, integrated, complex system. And this is a very crude outline of biocomplexity, how it works, but proteinomics are the DNA. They're the kind of the base, think of proton, of a protein as a word. They're really how uh, the, the building blocks of nature. Metabolomics and metabolism. So we know that you can have DNA, but unless there's the flow of energy and material, resources, nutrients across that DNA, it's not going to prosper. Metagenomics is the larger system, the integration of all that information and energy, but particularly the information that creates the coherence of the whole brought, built out of the individual parts. And epigenetics is this new field in which we're learning how the knowledge about how things in the system responds feeds back and affects the original DNA. It doesn't change the DNA, but it changes how it expresses. And this gives rise to these magnificent wetlands and other qualities of nature that are so responsive, as we've heard, to the changes of, uh, uh, of volatility. And these build up, these little pieces build up and integrate across whole large regions. This is the Seattle region, a bioregion. Now, human beings are building also very uh, different kind of systems. Ours tend to be more complicated versus complex. So what is a complicated system? It's linear rather than dynamic. This, for example, is the New York City watershed system. Think of a million miles of pipes and valves, water flowing by gravity from the Catskills down through our tap. Uh, very, very complicated, but what it lacks is the regenerative capacity. It's a linear system. It, it, it doesn't have the ability to learn. It's subject to entropy. It does not have the ability to repair itself. So when a complicated system meets with a complex system, we get a crash. So this is Hurricane Sandy, and we saw it happen with that. Dust storms, we have heat waves that are rising, tornadoes, uh, fires that are coming from the, just the climate change that we're seeing. But we're also seeing a clash when our cities, which are rapidly growing, are clashing with our social systems. So we're seeing this great disjunction because our cities are not serving the well-being of the, of the residents that live in them. This is London, where there were a lot of riots two years ago. And the riots were because there was an invisible structure. So there are both physical structures in our cities and structural social structures. If you look at this map, everywhere where the red is deeper is a place, deeper poverty. And the little dots, the little Google dots, show where um, the riots broke out. And they broke out on that edge where the lower middle class could not become middle class. This issue about complicated versus complex thinking goes back to the beginning of our civilization. So the Greeks were really good at thinking about uh, complicated systems. And if you remember the pursuit of the atom, the goal to take the universe and simplify it and find the constituent parts and develop a logic, the platonic forms, etc., from which everything was based. That was actually a way of disintegrating the universe. The, um, Chinese, on the other hand, were all looking at harmony and balance. This is actually the um, Hall of Supreme Harmony. It was the capital in the Forbidden City. Can you imagine if the White House was called, or the Kremlin were called the Hall of, of Supreme Harmony rather than the Kremlin of the White House? So totally different organizational structure and civilization structure. Now what happens is we are experiencing extremely rapid growth. This is a time lapse of photography from 84 to today of Las Vegas. And just look at how, like an infection almost, the city spreads so rapidly. And I'm going to show you the same thing. This is the Shenzhen Valley. In, uh, this is the Pearl River Valley where Shenzhen and uh, Guangzhou are in China. Again, look at this incredible rapid growth. You can see it kind of just spreading. In the beginning, if you go to the photo, there it is, all nature. and the end, it's all, all development. This is what it looks like on the ground. This is Las Vegas. And this is Guangzhou. So we are rapidly developing these complicated systems. We're on top of a natural system. And as I said, there's a conflict that is coming. We also have cities that are in rapid, this is Detroit, that are in rapid decline. So there's areas of growth and there's areas of shrinkage. And we've not figured out how to adapt to either. These are planning codes and environmental impact statements, the best tools of the 20th century. And yet they're completely unadapted to the issues of the 21st century. And the reason why is they are static tools. We are trying to deal with complex dynamic problems with static tools. 
So taking the model of how nature builds, let's look at how we could transform that into a model for human systems, for city systems. So protonomics, the, the uh, DNA of our cities is our building codes and our zoning codes. The metabolics, or the metabolomics, are materials, water, energy, markets, the flow of material. Now what we know, for example, is you can zone an entire city to be 30 stories tall, but it won't all be 30 stories tall. It'll grow where there are markets and it won't grow where there's not transportation or other things to stimulate it. So the metabolic flows across cities and across systems are not equal. They follow pathways of opportunity. The metagenomics, we have no large-scale, dynamic, current, integrating system for the growth of our cities. They happen by a whole series of individual actions. Individuals build buildings when we look at how slums grow across the vast, new rising cities of the development world. They're all happening spontaneously. It's emergent phenomena. But we do not have an organizing system to manage the DNA of that towards a healthier, more resilient system. We don't have the epigenetics that takes what's happening on the ground in terms of social systems, information flow, material flow, energy, and feeds it back. Okay. So I have a concept, which I call the well-tempered city, which begins to address this. It comes from Bach's well-tempered clavier. Here we are at BAM, the home of art. So it was a good analogy. What Bach did when he wrote the well-tempered clavier is he wrote an incredible piece of music that addressed every single scale and every single note in that scale. The DNA of the entire history of Western harmony is in this one piece. So that the re even if you're in the key of C, embedded within the well-tempered clavier are solutions for the harmony in the key of F. And by the way, look at the notes. Just look at how they sweep up and down, the sense of flow within them. So number one, we plan for immediate solutions. We need to design and plan for all of the solutions. In a way, we need to have the DNA of the future evolution of our cities all at hand, and then this epigenetic ability for different parts to be encoded, to be turned on and off as needed. The second thing is well-tempered, so tempered steel. We take steel, steel is very brittle, and when we temper it, it becomes flexible and strong at the same time. We heard earlier about the idea of making things that they can actually fail gracefully. So this is the new San Francisco Oakland Bay Bridge, and it's being designed to fail. It's being designed with parts that when under high stress separate and can be replaced within four hours. So that, and then there's a bunch of spare parts actually embedded within the bridge. So it's designed, it's designed to move like the willow when the, when the earthquakes come for the future. Also, by the way, so this is uh, returning to Guangzhou, so nature. We need to bring nature back. We need to integrate it into our infrastructure. New York City is doing an extraordinary job with green streets. Here they've actually taken the buried water that was in a pipe underneath this uh, elevated highway and made a beautiful park. And the last thing is we need well-tempered cities about well-tempered people. We need to actually design cities for the well-being of people, the social and individual well-being, because it is only, and we'll hear more about this later, in the thriving of social systems that we actually ultimately have the flexibility, the resilience to have sustainable cities. And it occurs on the individual level, the social level. So I'm going to give you one quick example of how this is put together in a project in the South Bronx. It's called Via Verde. So, so first of all, passive. One of the things we need to think about is um, how complicated systems can function in the passive mode when the power goes out. So this is a sunscreen system which shades the apartments so that they are sunny during the winter and cooler during the summer. We think about building the social infrastructure. Too often when we build our infra physical infrastructure, we think only about the hard side. So this is children's play areas and it has uh, an amphitheater. By the way, there's a community film shown in this amphitheater just two nights ago. It has an orchard, community gardens, places for people to come together. And by the way, the way the gardens are organized, people don't have individual beds. They have collective beds. Because our goal is to use these all as a framework for building altruistic, integrative communities that call upon the holistic parts of our minds and brains and call upon us to be members of the resilient community of the future. Thank you.